Good morning. Ah, goedemorgen. I can, I can speak Dutch still. Good. All right. Um, well, for people that don't know me, you're not supposed to know me anyway. Um, my name is indeed Bert Belder, uh, and this is my limited history with Node.js. So I got involved in 2010. In 2011, we started working on LibUV, which is the internal like event loop and uh, I/O abstraction library. In this talk, I'm gonna like mash that all together and pretend it's all like one thing. In 2013, we, uh, I was one of the founders of StrongLoop, probably the least important one. I need to be honest about that, but. Um, and but you might know it from like cool stuff like Loopback, um, and then in 2015 uh, that got acquired by IBM, and so now I'm here in my blue T-shirt. And this is also a sponsored talk, by the way. So you know, tune into your subconsciousness for you know invisible uh, instances of product placement and like <laughs> things you really do not want to know. Do you know the? Does anyone here has like the someone uh, on the internet's wrong syndrome sometimes? So like my, this like, usually when you do a keynote you have to talk about like the community and like where it's very important by the way but and like w you know where is the project heading like in the grand scheme of things but this is not this talk this is just purely a technical talk and the reason is that if sometimes i enter this in the uh, you know you want to make a talk yourself um, and you enter no just event loop i'm looking for some sort of diagram and every time I cringe because like these are all wrong. I'm sorry. Like if you if you made one of these, I'll buy you a beer afterwards. But like no, no, no. So like for example, do does like networking happen in happen in the thread pool? No, no, no. Really no. And the event queue is not not a thing. Um, what was this slide again? Oh yes, the event loop returns stuff to the client. No, it does not. There's no non-blocking worker thread pool. No, no, no. Or you know a stack of events. You know you know a stack is a data structure, and you take you know put stuff on top, and you take them top first. No, it is not a thing. <laughs> oh, the, the photo, by the way, is, is Trevor Norris. I did not want to implicate him. He's an awesome uh, CTC member. You know, it was just a coincidence. <laughs> this is a this this one's kind of good. It, I have some. You find this on Stack Overflow. It's probably the best one that you can find on the internet. But still, I do not agree with the way process the next stick is uh, is. Uh, added to this slide. Okay, so first, before I um, get started with like uh, showing how you how it should be uh, represented, I need to, to um, share some dirty secret with you. Um, so we're kind of used to well, if you're not doing Node.js and, and like asynchronous I/O evented programming, you're kind of used to writing code like this, right? Like you say connect and write and read, and you make. Um, you, you give commands to your operating system, it will do stuff for you. And you know, you said what you want, it will give you the result back. And you know, for a, you know, a, a new person, it might seem that your computer is actually working really hard when you're doing this, when you're you know, sending data to the network, it might be you know, busy with it. But really, that's total bullshit. Um, like somewhere in the, in the early... 90s, every computer learned a trick called direct memory access, and that meant that, you know, whenever your CPU, which is your program, runs on your CPU, right, uh, wanted to do something with, you know, a hard disk or a network card, it would just send a command to some peripheral device, and the peripheral device would kind of figure it out with the memory. And so your CPU could just easily do something else in the meantime because it didn't have to constantly work to push data to it to the devices. And then what happens when the device is done, or it, it needs more data, or whatever, it will send an interrupt to your CPU. Um, and it's called interrupt for a reason. Like CPUs have a very you know, questionable attention span, because at the moment that happens, it will just instantly jump and you know, go handle that interrupt and, and kind of forget where it was in the first place. Um, it's kind of an issue. Uh, it's very hard to program computers like that. If you, uh, you know, have done some microcontroller programming, you might have to do that yourself. It's really not easy to get right. So it's kind of understandable that people came up with this because it just, you know, if you're not very smart like me, this is just way easier. Yeah, oh, yeah. So this is, the, this is the dirty secret. Your operating system takes care of, like, that, that total lie that you're dealing with. Anyway, in Node.js, we... You know, we have an event loop, and that means that we can do asynchronous programming, but we don't have to, you know, deal with the like ADD kind of uh, processor, uh, uh, the way the processor works. So this is the start. This is how I would start in a diagram of an event loop. You start with 
you know, it, it always starts with your actual program. It's not a callback. It's just whatever is in index.js or whatever happens when you do npm start. And at the very end, we also know there is, you always get this like process exit event. And, and everyone who has ever tried to use it knows that you, know, you can't really use it for anything because it's really the last thing that's ever going to happen. And since Node.js is asynchronous, you, will, you, know, you set a timer. It will never fire. You, you, know, you try to write some data to the network. It might go out, but you can never tell. It's really not very practical. But this is sort of the beginning and the end. So let's fill out the, the blanks. There's just basically four steps that an event loop takes at every, every iteration. First of it is it will figure out if there were any timeouts. Um, you know, so uh, I'll, I'll get into how that actually works later. Then there's the unicorn. And the unicorn, I'll, I'll give you much more detail on that later. Um, but that does the most of the magic. If there's any disk or network or child process activity going on in your process, it will find those events there. And it will maybe do some more management internally. And it will call your callbacks. That's the most important things. Thing. And I, I have all these like four JS boxes in here because there's really no ev you know, event loop that sends things. Like it's, it, you know, your event loop just goes back and forth. It, it, you know, inter it goes into libuv and figures simers and then it calls your JavaScript. And then it figures out network events and calls your JavaScript. And then it goes on in set immediate queue. So that's everything you did with set immediate. And at that point, it will call all your callbacks. And then finally, there's this sort of internal phase where we create closed events and clean up open sockets and uh, that kind of stuff. And then we get at this like, nice little corner here. Uh, and you know, libuv or node decides whether to keep running or go to that like, infamous process exit event. All right, so a little bit more you know, like detail here. Let's say your little JavaScript that run right there after figuring the set immediate callbacks uh, you know, it's, let's say it calls set timeout. What happens internally is we add your, you know, your timer. We compute when, you know, when to set the alarm. Basically, we add it to um, the timer heap. This is a picture of like there's an actual timer heap somewhere in the world. If you're from France, you might recognize it. This is at Saint Lazare station, um, and uh, at the, by the time the, the event loop gets to the little alarm uh, spot, it will look at the at the timer heap figure out which ones have expired, and then call your callback. Simple enough. Same goes for, let's say, creating a server. A server is not done with the thread pool. It's, we go directly to the operating system and ask it, hey, give us, you know, give us a, a, a notification if, if a new uh, connection is made to our server. And then you know, when the, the unicorn function is trying to, trying to figure out those events, it will pick up the fact that there is a new connection. Last but not least, the minions, uh, we call it workers internally, worker threads. There's typically four, not three. Um, and you know, if you do something with the file system, it will get a worker. It will go do it for you. And then, at the, again, the, the unicorn function will figure that out. This also kind of explains how Node.js knows how, whether it should exit or it should just keep going. Um, because it's, it's simple as that. You know, every time we send. You know, we start an, an operation like this file stuff that we send to the worker. We add, add one to uh, uh, the reference counter. And then when the callback comes, when the event happens, we just subtract at one. Very simple. Um, and that means that at that like, little uh, you know, split where we can either decide exit or continue, we can just look. Is, if the reference counter is 0, we exit. Otherwise, we don't. Simple as that. OK, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, the unicorn function. Um, oh, this is that thing again, the, the code that I showed you in the beginning. What stands out about these functions, connect, write, and read, is that they both do something and they get the result. And that means that at, you know, your program, of course, cannot keep running. And what we want to do inside Node.js is kind of kick off these operations, but we know it cannot, because we want to do things asynchronously, we cannot have the result immediately. And so what the unicorn function must be able to do is get the, get the results of like anything that was going on in the background. I'm not going to go into all the details of how this works. Actually, if you want to do that, I think there's a code and learn on Saturday morning by Saul. And he will give you probably all the details and stuff you even don't want to know. Um, 
So this is the unicorn function, and it's all built on top of very different um, operating system concepts. It depends on which operating system you're running on. Uh, there's epoch wait, um, and epoch wait will only tell you basically if there's a network socket um, that can be read or written to. And basically, everything else that we need to be able to pick up in the unicorn function need to be shoehorned into that model. So like practically speaking, for example, if we need to pick up an event from the thread pool, is that we create a secret internal pipe, and like, the thread pool writes at one end, and then you know, this equal weight function um, you know, reads at one, uh, the other side. K event is what, what happens in BSDs and, and OSX, kind of the same thing. And then there's Windows. It has get queued completion status. And as you can already see in the name, it gives you a completion status that was somehow queued. And the completion status, of course, the result that we were looking for. And that queuing is happening actually automatically. Um, and then what I'm not seeing here, seeing here is um, there is all these unicorn functions must have a timeout. So when we run them, what we do is we basically compute when the next timeout you know, it will happen. We don't really care about the ones in the far future, just the next one. So we can you know, say, OK, if nothing happens for the next 10 seconds, um, and the next time it's in the next 10 seconds, then it will just return with no events. And that we, you know, the event loop will you know, go back spinning, and it will hit that timer place again and uh, run uh, your timeouts. Um, there was something else I needed to say about this, but I forgot. That's kind of dumb. All right. Um, so if you need to make any diagrams, just don't pretend everything happens in a thread pool. That's very painful for me, because we try very hard not to do that. <laughs> and also, it, it confuses people, because they're like, well, no, it's like really not like you know, they say synchronous, but really it's a thread pool. It's just like Java, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. What we cared about most when we made Node.js is to make a very scalable server, so something that could do like thousands of open connections. And you can actually do that with WebSockets if you ever tried that. Node.js doesn't break a sweat. Um, and so whenever we can, we, we try to use the kernel. So nothing else. We just ask the operating system, hey, give us a signal, and tell the unicorn function um, when, you know, when, there's, when something happened. But that's, it's not always possible. Unfortunately, operating systems are not very good, and so files um, and sometimes pipes have to run in the thread pool. And then there's this, this is very maybe practical to know. Whenever you look up a domain, so you say, well, you use a request, for example, and you say, hey, get me google.com. Um, what happens is uh, the dns.lookup function gets called, and that also runs in a thread pool. And the, the reason for that is uh, that uh, the way your computer looks up um, DNS, locates DNS records is kind of operating system specific, and people expect it to, accept, to happen or to behave exactly the same as your browser. And so we have to use the operating system there. Uh, there are better DNS functions that actually, actually are asynchronous, but you have to call them manually. And, but I, if, you know, if you ever have a performance issue, I would say try to look at that. Um, the bottom two rows are not really, or columns are not really that important. We need to use signal handlers sometimes. Signal handlers are kind of like interrupts in the, in the sort of computer architecture picture. It is also something that can immediately distract your program. That's why nobody ever uses signal handlers for any serious programming, because it's kind of impossible to get right. And Windows has like this weird, weird concept of wait threads, which means you spin up a thread to basically just wait for stuff. Um, and we needed to use it sometimes. We try not to. Um, so to complete the picture, what kind of stands out about this, if you compare it with the, the earlier ones that I said were wrong, is like some stuff is really not in here. Like event emitters are not in here, and they really shouldn't be in here. But also not in here is next stick and, and like promise of resolve. And the reason is that they are kind of an event loop of their own. So every yellow box that you saw on this slide kind of has like an, a little a little uh, event loop inside it. And that little event loop inside it has another, even smaller event loop inside it. And so that means that after we call that callback that you thought was going to run, node after that is going to check, are there any resolved promises? And it's going to keep doing that until there are no more resolved promises. And then it's going to check, are there more next stick um, events or callbacks going on in your program? And it will also keep doing that uh, until there are no more next stick callbacks. So if you remember, Node.js 10, I believe, it, might, it would sometimes complain, hey, you had 10,000. 
That's because we were afraid you were locking up your program uh, you know, by con calling next continuously, and it would never escape this like, little inside loop. Um, yeah, it also, by the way, it, isn't it weird? Sorry for that. I'm kind of responsible. Next stick is really not the next stick. It's just immediate. And then setimi is not very immediate at all. It's more like <laughs> the next stick. But whatever. Um, just remember that. OK, this is all. I'll tweet, the, I'll tweet the, the slides. So if you ever have to write a book and need, a, um, need to like, not screw up, then, you know. Look, look at the talk again. Thank you very much. <clears throat>